summer we've been studying the book of Acts in a series called Legends, and we're really just studying heroes of faith in the book of Acts. So it's been a lot of fun, and um, I'm calling today and the rest of the messages I have left the final four, all right? We only got four messages left in this series, and so um, we've studied some wonderful people and people of faith who've inspired our faith. And uh, we've learned a lot from them. And so I believe the Lord has some more for us for the next few weeks. Our theme verse or passage of scripture is found in Acts chapter 17. So if you brought a Bible, you can turn there. Acts chapter 17 and verse 6 is where we're going to look at. And then if you can manage, all right, if you can manage, we're going to look at Acts chapter 3 as well. So I know it's only a few pages away. But Acts chapter 17 and verse 6 is where we are going to start. Amen. And it says here, and it's being said concerning Paul and Silas. They've just come into another town, another city, and uh, they've been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power and demonstration of the Spirit of God. Things are changing. People's lives are being turned upside down. The religious world, as it was known then, is being flipped upside down on its head. I mean, things, things are changing because of Jesus. I mean, you know, Jesus changes everything, by the way. And so even after Jesus has already been raised, raised from the dead and he's ascended on high and he's given his spirit, his people are still proclaiming the same truth that Jesus was proclaiming and the truth of who Jesus was and is and the salvation that's found in him. And they roll into a new town and this is what it was said of them. It says, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. These who've turned the world upside down have come here too. And I've been saying this almost every time at the beginning of, of this message or these messages. And that's just this. I believe that Christians, uh, God has designed the believer to be a person or an individual who turns the world upside down. Do I have any world changers in the room on this Sunday morning? That's 10 of you. Anybody else believing like, man, God is going to use me to do some great stuff. Glory to God, to turn the world upside down. Come on, when you show up on the job, things are different. Hallelujah. When you show up at school in a couple of the weeks, things are going to be different. When you show up, hallelujah, at the gym, things are different because you walked in the room. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. God's called us, called us to be world changers. I really believe this. And so uh, another one of those individuals that we're going to look at who was a world changer in, in that time, we see in the book of Acts chapter 3, and we're going to look at him. His name is Peter. Have you ever heard of the apostle Peter? Acts chapter 3, and we're going to look at a few verses here together. Acts chapter 3 and verse 1. If you got it, say amen. amen. If you don't got it, just grunt. <laughs> Okay, no grunts, praise the Lord. So everybody has it or they don't want to grunt. Um, I can understand. Acts chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now Peter and John, John is uh, one of the disciples of Jesus as well, and apparently one of Peter's running buddies here. It says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. Now the ninth hour would be uh, 3 p.m. And typically in Jewish custom they would have uh, three times of prayer throughout the day. And so this is one of those times, three o'clock, they're going to pray at the temple. And it says there was a, a certain man lame from his mother's womb and he was carried and they laid him daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful. And he was laid there to ask alms from those who entered the temple. All right. So if you can get this picture here, this guy is, is, has been brought to the temple gate where people are entering to go and pray or worship. And he's, he's laying there, and he's laying there for one specific purpose. What, what's that purpose? I mean, he's asking for money, basically. He's, he's begging. He's asking, asking for, for alms. And, and, and because he, 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 couldn't, he couldn't walk. He, he, he'd been lame from his mother's womb, Scripture says. So this guy's he's just at... At the temple, and it says that he saw who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Are y'all with me still? He sees Peter and John walking in. Of course, you would imagine this is this, you know, this would be a good time to ask people for money. I mean, they're going to church to pray, all right? They're going to church to connect with God. And so you would think that those people who've who've been taught scripture, they know the importance of being good to the poor, helping the needy, all of that, would be a generous kind of people, right? So this guy's located here for a purpose, right? Because he's expecting to, to get money from people because he's 
he's, he's of no use, per se, to society. In that time, people who were like this, they really couldn't do anything. I mean, there really wasn't anything for them to, to do in order to gain financial increase into their life. And so really, they were pushed to the side. I'm not sure how long he would have, have been put by this gate, but I would imagine it had been a number of years of his life where he just lives this way, just asking people for money. And he's sitting there, and he, he sees Peter and John coming up, and he, he's just asking people for, for alms, asking people for money with expectation to receive something. And he says, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. All right, so again, the picture here is this guy's sitting here. He's, he's begging. He's asking for money. Peter and John are walking by, and this guy's just asking for money for people who are coming in at the hour of prayer. And Peter sets his eyes upon this guy. Peter sets his eyes upon this guy, and he tells him something. Look at us. Look at us. Well, I mean, if you were the guy who's whose job is basically just to ask for money, what would your expectation be? Well, this guy asked me to look at him because why? He going to give me some money, right? I mean, look at us. I'm like, well, I'm good. All right, look at us. And I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if, if what John was thinking in this moment, but if you know anything about the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Peter is kind of wild. If you know, if you know, he's kind of, he's kind of, he's got a wild streak. He's pretty crazy in a good way and sometimes not a good way, but he, he's, he's a pretty wild guy. And so he says, look at us, look at us. So he gave his attention expecting to receive something from them. What is he expecting? Some sort of money, right? Expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. Now, if, if you were the beggar in that moment, what, what would your emotion be? Doggone. <laughs> you know? I mean, wouldn't your heart drop? For just a second, your heart would drop and go, bro, don't tell me to look at you. When you know I'm asking for money and you tell me to look at you and I can see you're walking in here and then tell me you got no money. Now, I believe that Peter is actually telling the truth. I don't believe Peter's a liar. I don't believe Peter's completely broke, but I do believe in that moment he doesn't have any money in his pocket. All right? And I would think if I was Peter's running buddy and I was John, and I just heard Peter tell the guy, look at us, I'd be like, hey, pff, we don't got no money, man. Why are you telling the guy to look at us? We're going in to pray. All right? I didn't bring, I didn't bring any, any, any money with me. He, he says, look at us, but then he says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. If you have your Bible, a highlighter, a pen, whatever you're doing to, to, to take notes today, you make sure you, you highlight or underline that. What I do have... I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then not only does he, he tell him to rise up and walk, but, but watch what happens next. And he took him by the right hand. He took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them. Oh. Not only, not only is he he's standing up now miraculously with 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 keep this keep this in mind, okay? This guy, this guy hasn't walked a day in his life. It's not like he got sick when he's 11 or 12 years old. It's not like someone dropped him when he was two or three years old. And it met, no, I mean, literally, he's never walked a day in his life. I don't know if you've ever had, a, had your leg or your foot or something in a cast or your arm. You realize that after you haven't used something for a while, that you lose the strength, don't you? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You lose the strength if you, you know, you just, you, just don't, you just don't have the strength or the muscle that you used to have. So if you can think about the miracle of what's happening in this moment, it's, it's not just that he stood up. I mean, he, he stands up and, and he's got strength in his legs now. 
He's got muscle in his legs now. He's got power in his legs now. And it says that he walks into the temple with them. And not, not only that, he says he leaping up, stood, walked in the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Walking, leaping, and praising God. I'm about to jump off this stage. No, I'm not. Hallelujah. Walking, leap. I mean, walking. I don't know. Woo! Woo! I got hops, man. If you don't know it, it's the truth. I got hops. I think I'm going to need massage later, but that's all right. Walking, I mean, leaping and praising God. Now, I don't know if you've ever been set free, but once Jesus sets you free, if you had been laid by the temple gate for who knows how long, probably years of his life, all right, and in a moment, by the power of God and the power in the name of Jesus, you now have the strength to not only stand up and just, just walk. You got the strength to walk, to leap, and to praise God. You talk about unreserved, undignified, who gives a flying hoo-ha what anybody thinks about me right now. I know this is going to this is gonna cause a commotion in the temple, but I just, I just do not care. Is anybody in here... <laughs> God's done something goes so good in your life, you have a I do not care kind of praise. You know what I mean? Like, I'm in it. No, you don't. You're still sitting in your seat. You, anybody in here have a I do not care what anybody thinks. Jesus has set me free. Woo! He delivered me. <laughs> Amen. I'm no longer bound to the ground. I have been healed, delivered. Woo! I am standing upright. I am walking tall. <laughs> Years of bondage and in one moment in the power of Jesus, <sighs> set free. Glory to God. Amen. Walking, leaping, and praising God. That, that's why, just on a side, side note, that's why I believe, you know, church should be sweet. It should be worshipful. It should be reverent in, in many ways. But the church should also be loud from time to time. And there should be a ruckus. There should be a praise. There should be a shout. There should be some rejoicing. There should be some jubilation. There should be some freedom that is demonstrated. Hallelujah. And from time to time, you'll see in our church, on a Sunday morning, people run around a church. You ever see somebody run around our church? Uh, well, I remember one time a guy visited our church, and, and he's trying to figure out why people ran around the church. And, and I, was, I was explaining it to him, and he said, the first time I saw somebody run around the church, run around y'all's church, I thought somebody had grabbed somebody's purse and run out the door. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> and I know sometimes it's, it's, it's super emotional and people get super excited, but I got to tell you, man, if you've been delivered, you've been set free, and, and for some of you, even it, it was 20 years ago, but when you just think back to how good God has been to you, when you think about how he delivered you when you think back to how he saved you you just don't care what anybody thinks in that moment because they didn't save you they didn't set you free they didn't heal your body they didn't deliver you but the Lord Jesus Christ did the power of God did the power of the Spirit of God quickened you Woo! hallelujah <laughs> oh amen <laughs> I believe for most people, the number one reason why they don't praise like that is because they care what other people think. Amen. Number one reason. <laughs> and the sooner you realize people are not thinking about you. You know what most people are thinking about? Themselves. The sooner you just lose it and go, whoo, man, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Whoo. Hey, Amen. Man, that is not the main point of this message, but my God, it is a good one. Walking, leaping, and, and praising God. And it says, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. They're in awe. In awe. If it was your habit to go and pray that time of the day and that guy had been there for years, 
You probably knew something about that guy. You may have known his mom or dad. You may know the backstory. You may know something about his family. And to now see this same guy praising God as he stands upright and he rejoices. Woo, what a day to be at church, y'all. It would stir your, it would stir your heart. But what I want you to see today is, is Peter. Peter didn't focus on what he, he didn't have. Peter focused on what he did have. And it's easy in life to make an excuse for things not changing because of what you don't have. But one thing Peter and John didn't have in that moment was an excuse. What they did have, however, was confidence. What they did have, however, was faith in the name of Jesus. What they did have in that moment was an assurance that what Jesus said was true, that they could Heal the sick in the name of Jesus. People would be delivered in the name of Jesus. Demons would be cast out in the name of Jesus. That things could change, lives could be transformed in the name of Jesus. And I, I like the boldness and the courage that it took for Peter in a moment to, instead of just passing the guy by and knowing he doesn't have any money, to stop, look at the guy, and then say something to him and say, hey, man, you need to look at me. And the guy looks at him, and the guy knows after he says, I don't have any money. Like, okay, here we go. But Peter's like, no, 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 you don't understand. What I got is more valuable than money. What I got is more valuable than five bucks in my pocket. What I got is more valuable than 10 bucks. My, what, what I got is more valuable than a check I could write to you. I want you to understand that what I don't have isn't holding me back from giving you what I do have. Because what I do have has the power to transform your life. What I do have has the power to get you up off the ground on this day. Hallelujah. What I do have has the power to put power in those powerless, broken down legs of yours. I'm preaching pretty good for a white boy, I tell you what. I'll use what I do have to produce what we don't have right now. What did Peter know that he had? He knew he had the name of Jesus. We're in Acts 3 now. The Holy Spirit's been given. Peter's full of the power of the Holy Spirit, full of authority in the name of Jesus, full of the truth and the word and the promise of Jesus Christ and the word of God. He's carrying that. I know what I got. And today, the title of this message is simply this. I'll use what I got. Instead of making excuses for what I don't have, I'll use what I got to make a difference today. It's easy to live life and go, well, if I only had it like so-and-so, if I only had the position that they had, if I only had the amount of money that they have or drove the car that they have or had the opportunities that they have, or if I only had this position or if I only had this much of time left or if I could only go back in time and re-raise my kids or if only I could go back and change situations or things in my relationships or the social, what, if I could only go back and, and the truth is this, you, you, can't, you can't change what's back there but you, you can move forward here now today. What, what looks like a problem in front of you and what looked like a, a problem for Peter and John was really an opportunity. The problems that are before you, listen to me, are opportunities right in front of you. And if you'll use what you got, which it might just be an opportunity, it might just be, it might just have a, a gift or a talent or an ability or a season of life or a time or a job or, or whatever, you might just have just this right here, but if, if you'll use what you got, listen, Little is much when God is in it. God can do big things with little stuff. 
In Peter's life, listen, here we see him in Acts chapter 3, but a little bit of the backstory is this. I mean, in the book of Luke, we see how, how Jesus, Jesus got a hold of Peter. I mean, Peter's a fisherman, y'all. Peter and his brother Andrew, they're fishermen. That's what they do. That's their life. That's all they know. We fish. And after they'd been fishing one day, they, they roll back up and they go and they clean their nets and Jesus happens to be there teaching. And Jesus gets in Peter's boat, doesn't even ask. Can you believe that? Doesn't even ask. Gets in, gets in Peter's boat. Peter's like, What's, this, guy, this guy's in my boat. And then, then Jesus tells, tells Peter, hey, why don't you cast, cast your boat out into the deep, launch out into the deep. You're going to have a big time catch. You got to keep in, in mind something here. Peter's a fisherman. Jesus, teacher slash carpenter. When a carpenter tells a fisherman how to fish, what do you think the fisherman says? Go build me a table. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, don't tell me how to fish, all right, and I won't tell you how to build stuff, right? That could have been Peter's response, but instead, he said, listen, we've been working hard at this. We haven't called anything. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll do it. Now, for Peter, in that moment, he said, I'll use what I got. And what I got right now is just one word from Jesus. And for some of you, that may be the case right now. You may not have a whole lot, but you know what God has said to you. If you'll just use and hold on to what you got, it can produce something supernatural. All right, I'll, I'll go out. He pushes the boat out. They catch a heap of fish so much Boat can't hold it. He's got to get his partners to come in. Let's get all these fish, man. How are we going to do this? They get back to the shore, and Jesus tells them, look, from now on, you're going, to, you're going to catch men. You're not going to be a fisher of fish. You're going to fish for people. And in that moment, all Peter had was an invitation. He goes from a word, acts on a word. He's got an invitation, and the Scripture says that he left it all and followed Jesus. And from that moment... For three, three and a half years, he follows Jesus around. Imagine what, what it'd be like to follow Jesus around for three, three and a half years. Anybody ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? That's what it'd been like. There's some of the stuff you saw plus a whole bunch more, all right? He's seeing all kinds of stuff. I mean, one of the things he sees right away is that Jesus teaches, Jesus preaches, and Jesus heals. Aren't you glad Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever? He still preaches, teaches. I mean, he's still helping us. Hallelujah. And, and that's what he's seeing. And immediately he sees something else. I mean, and Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. How many know Jesus loves mother-in-laws? Even if you don't, praise the Lord. I'm kidding. I love my mother-in-law. She's right here. I love you. She's the best. I mean, miracles, miracles are happening, right? Peter's watching this Jesus, and I mean, signs, wonders. Uh, there's one place where there's a, a young girl who's dead, and Jesus raises her from the dead. People who are sick for years and years and years are healed in a moment by the power of Jesus. I mean, just absolutely astonishing and amazing. There, there's, there's actually a couple times where this happens, but the first one we see in the book of Matthew is, where, is, is when there's a, there's a crowd around Jesus, about 5,000 men, it says, so probably who knows how many people, 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 people, if you add all the women and children. There's a whole crew of people, and They've been listening to Jesus teach, but no, nobody's got any food. Everybody's hungry. So the disciples are like, well, you know, Jesus, the you know, uh, everybody's hungry. We don't got any food. Let's send everybody home. And, and, and Jesus says, what do we got? So well, we, we can find out what we got. Well, all we got is five loaves and, and two fish, you know. If you were one of the disciples, what would you have thought Jesus would say next? Yeah, send everybody home. That's definitely not going to work. <laughs> but th that's not what Jesus, that's not what, that's not what, what Jesus said. Because I believe, listen, in Acts chapter 3, Peter used what he had because I believe he saw this demonstrated in the life of Jesus. Because in the life of Jesus, Jesus didn't see five loaves and two fish as not enough. He saw five loaves and two fish as an opportunity for a miracle. And some of you sitting in your seat today are like, I don't have enough. No, you have an opportunity for a miracle if you turn it over to Jesus. And that's what Jesus said. Oh, five loaves, two fish. Perfect. We're going to have tuna fish sandwiches. This, this is great. 
And they're like, uh, okay. He blesses it, starts breaking it, starts multiplying it. I mean, imagine all the disciples, and they got all these people sitting in numbers, and they got them in certain groups, and, and they're, they're bringing people bread, bringing people fish. And they're like, here you go. And they go back, and like, he's still making, there's still more? Like, there's still more. Yeah, there's still more. I got me another basket. Like, and then John, and then all, all the disciples, and Peter, and Andrew, and all these got James. They're like, just keep, keep feeding the people. And the miracle is happening before their eyes. The miracle is happening in their hands. They're seeing this supernatural multiplication of something that looked like not enough be something that ends up being, oh, y'all helping me preach now, more than enough because we know after it's all over, they got 12 baskets left, one for every tribe of Judah. I don't know if that's true or not. Anyway. Little is much when God is in the middle of it. Woo! <laughs> Somebody ought to just get happy right now and say, oh, yeah, right here, right now. What, what I know I got, I'm going to use what I got. Will you make what seems little in your life available to the one who can multiply it in your life? So if that's not enough, you read just a few chapters over in Matthew, right after this miracle happens, there's another crowd of 4,000 people. You'd think they'd learn their lesson or something. You're like, hey, when you come here, Jesus, bring food. He's going to talk a long time. Y'all think this hour and a half service is long. It's not long, y'all, all all right? Bring some food. Everybody, but no, there's another crowd, 4,000 people. Everybody's hungry. Same thing happens again, except this time they have seven loaves and a few fish. Seven loaves. How many know that's not fair for Jesus? That's too easy. Seven loaves are like, Jesus like, oh, seven loaves. You remember, the, you remember the five loaves? We got two extra, praise God. That lets you know something about Jesus, all right? He loves carbs. It's just this joke there. We have a lot of people around here on, on keto. Have you ever heard of keto, the keto diet? I tell it, y'all know this joke. All right, it's for me. All right, just let me say it, though. I'm on keto as well. I really am. But I call it keto plus. As keto plus whatever I want to eat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Feeling that keto plus coming on right now. Hallelujah. You know I'm going to shut this down in just a few minutes. Peter saw these miracles before his very eyes. And you got to know. That while he's living his life as a disciple of Christ after the resurrection of Jesus, after the Holy Spirit is given, and he's walking up to this gate, he's like, well, I don't have any money, but I got something. I, I I know I got something. And if I'll give what I got, I believe God will make something supernatural, something miraculous out of it. Silver and gold I don't got right now, but what I do have, come on, what do you have? What do you have? What I do have, I'll give to you. What did Peter know that he had? He had the name of Jesus. He had the power of the Holy Spirit. He knew he had the promise of the word of God. Peter wasn't looking at his deficiency. He was looking at Christ's sufficiency. And if you would just stop living your life thinking about, meditating on, and constantly considering what you consider to be deficiencies in your life, where you think you fall short. And spend more time considering the sufficiency of Christ in your life. Who you are in him and who he is in you. I wrote down a couple things that I, I know that 
that I have, what I, what I do have, okay? I have a voice. I have a name. That's the name above every other name, the name of Jesus. I have a promise. And I have a praise. I have a voice. I have the name. I have a promise. And I have a praise. To Peter and John, in that moment, Peter focused on what he knew that he did have. And after this, this man gets healed supernaturally, set free from being bound to the ground. Hallelujah. You know, not everybody was happy about it. There's some leaders in the temple who are like, you know, we don't like that you, you, you preach in this name. We don't like that this is stirring things up again. I, we, don't, we don't like the way this is, this is working out. You, you, you seem to be unlearned and uneducated men, and yet you remain so bold. You must have been with Jesus. You had to know that Peter, when he's dealing with the guys who are telling him not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore, and they're, they're looking down their nose at him like, how in the world are you so bold? How in the world are you so confident? You're a fisherman, Peter. You don't have our education. You, you don't have the law memorized. You don't have everything figured out how we have it all figured out. You, you're just a fisherman. How in the world do, do, do you have the confidence and the boldness? But we do recognize something on you. And it's the same thing that we saw on Jesus. There's a confidence and authority and a boldness with which you speak that, that we just don't got. And maybe if you'd be more like Peter, y'all, if you'd realize that, hey, you know what? I, I'm growing, I'm learning, I'm developing, I'm moving forward. I, I may not have everything just, just, uh, just right just yet, but I do know what I got. And what I got and what I know that I got is what helps me to move forward every single day of my life. It was, it's what helps me to turn the world upside down every single day of my life. I am a world changer. I am going to live supernaturally. Glory to God. So you can look down your nose at me all you want, but don't be jealous. In Acts 4, 16, it says this, what they said to Peter and John. It says, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, a notable miracle has been done through them. And it is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. When you use what you got and you step out in faith, how many of y'all believe God can use you to do something that is undeniably God showing up big in your life? Peter and John are trying to respond these accusations, and they just, they just say this. This is Acts 4.20. It says, for we cannot, we cannot speak the things, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. What an awesome response. Are, are y'all still with me? Like, you know, we, we hear what you're saying. We know what you're telling us not to do anymore. We know you don't understand everything about our boldness and our confidence. We know that you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. We know that you don't really believe in the power of that name, even though you can't deny what's happening through that name. But all I know how to give is what I got. So I just give what I got. And what I got. It's what I've seen, heard, and experienced with Jesus. Oh. How much better would the world be if Christians, believers, 
actually gave what they got. I mean, if, if you gave what you got that Jesus gave you. What if what oozed out of you when the world just came pressing in was just grace, truth, forgiveness, compassion, love, mercy, authority, freedom, deliverance. Come on. Peace that passes understanding, patience, long-suffering, joy, kindness, all the fruit of the Spirit. All that just flew, just, just, just kind of just, just rolled out of you in the world that we're living in. So I've seen Jesus. I've been with Jesus. I've heard what he said, and I've heard what he's done. And all I can give is what I got, and I know he's done. I give what I got. Look, Peter would have been okay if he had just passed that guy by the temple gate. Peter would have been fine. How many know Peter probably would have had a great prayer time? Are y'all still with me? His prayer time would have probably been just great. Would have been just fine. But you know who would have missed out? Who would have missed out? The lame guy. The guy, the guy he, he, he'd have probably been there another 40, 50 years. He'd, 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 he'd still been there years later. Unless somebody. Listen. You giving what you got is about more than just you giving what you got so you get what you get. You given what you got has a world tied to it. There is a world that is depending on, that is craving, that is desiring who and what you got in you. There's an anointing that you got. There's a power that you got. There's a grace that you got. There's a love that you got. There's a strength that you got. There's a freedom that you got. And there is a world that is waiting for you to release what you got on the inside of you. Whether you feel like it's big, whether you feel like it's little, I'm telling you what, when you got the name of Jesus, that's a big thing. When you got the power of the Holy Spirit, that's a big thing. Hallelujah. When you got the promise of God, that's a big thing. You got big Big things on the inside of you. Hallelujah. And even if you feel like, I don't have a lot of influence, I don't have a lot of what, I don't have a big whatever. No, 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 no. The one matters. The steps of obedience matter. All of those things matter. And that, that man's life, the lame man, the, the next 40 years of his life were, were different. First 40 is like this. Please, somebody just give me some. I, I can't do anything else but this. I can do this. Next 40 years. <laughs> ne <laughs> ne next 40 years? Woo. The, ne the next 40 years now. I believe some of you, you're on the other side. You're on the other side. You're like, yeah, I once was blind. I once was lame. I once was broken. Woo, but Jesus picked me up. And you're on, the, you're on the other side. You're on the next 40 years. Glory to God. Woo. So what are you going to do with what you got now? What are you going to do with what you got now? What are you going to do with what you got now? Hallelujah. For this guy, if all he had for the rest of his life was just a testimony. You remember me? Yeah, I was that guy at the gate. You remember that? Remember me? I was the guy at the gate. I know that was 10 years ago, but think back. Remember there was a guy always said at the gate, that was me. I, and I, that was me. And then I was sitting there. Can you imagine him retelling the story? I was sitting there, and then these two guys walked up, and I looked at them, hoping they'd give me some money. And they told me to look at them, and then they didn't give me any money. And I thought, well, that's stupid. And then, But then they said that they're going to give me something better than money. And he said they're gonna, they, they told me to stand up. Peter told me to stand up in the name of Jesus Oh, the name above every other name, the saving name, the healing name, the delivering name. There's power in that name. He told me to stand up, and I tell you what, man, he grabbed me by the hand, and I stood up, and I've never been the same again. For some of you, you are the walking miracle. You're it. 
And the little thing that you think you got is actually a big thing because it's your testimony of what God has done in your life. You're like, I wish God would use me for some big things. Why don't you tell what God has done for you already? Why don't you tell other people about how God has saved you? Tell other people about how he delivered you. Tell them how you used to have that weight on your chest and on your shoulders and you couldn't get free, how you were bound, how you were broken, how there was no light at the end of the tunnel, but Jesus set you free. And even your worst day in the church is the best day you ever had in your life because of Jesus. Oh, man. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. I am so glad. There's still healing in that name, y'all. There's still salvation in that name. There's still deliverance in that name. There's still freedom in that name. There's still strength that is found in that name. Hallelujah. 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 I'm glad that Peter didn't just pass by on that day and say, I got to go to prayer right now. I know prayer changes things, but people who yield themselves to God, they change things too when they step out in faith. I have a voice, I have a name, I have a promise. I have a praise. It's the second time I've gone over these points. You should write them down. I'm telling you, who and what you got is bigger than you realize. I, I, I've learned a lot about who I am in Christ, the power of the word, the power of the name, but I just still think there's more that I need to see so I can understand the fullness of what I got in Christ Jesus. If I could just... I'll use what I got. I'll use what he's given me. I'll use the authority he's given me. I'll use the name he's given me. Hallelujah. If I use what I got, it'll change. It'll change what's in front of me. I'm not going to complain about the problem. I'm going to thank God for the opportunity to step out in faith and make a difference today. Peter didn't see the lame man as a problem. He saw the lame man as an opportunity for God to show up big in his life. People have issues, I know this, but it's opportunity. You have challenges, but it's opportunity. I'll, I'll use what I got. Do I have anybody here that says, I'll, I'll use what I got. I'll use what I, I'll use what I know I got. I, I'll use it. I'll use what I got. I'll use my voice to proclaim, to declare. I'll speak the power of the word. Hallelujah. I'll use that name. I'll use it for more than just praying for my lunch and my dinner. Hallelujah. I'm going to use that name with the authority that's found in that name. Hallelujah. I'll use the promises of God. I'll stand on them knowing that they're unchangeable, unshakable. It's a foundation to stand on the Word of God. It's forever settled in heaven. And I'll praise Him every step of the way. If you would like more information about Christian Worship Center, please visit our website at christianworshipcenter.com.